I am I, I, loving uh, the Olympics. I haven't watched the last couple of days. I think after like gymnastics done and swimming was kind of done. Like I'm not watching basketball and all that stuff. I just don't know. The track is on and off. I watched the track a little bit. The U.S. athletes, the track team is really good this year. I honestly think so. Like, they, I mean, come on. They like they were not supposed to win this much, and they have. I mean, the fight in them is pretty phenomenal. I don't know if you guys like uh, U.S. had a pretty good fight against Serbia. That we were down the whole game in basketball today and then you know came back from like 14 15 down and ended up winning so that was really good too there's a there's a statistic that like 40 percent of olympic u.s medalists are from texas texas pride <laughs> yep we love our uh tyson chicken here and there's something in that <laughs> i was about to say Please we, might be, you we guys... might be most obese but we might be the fastest on track too somehow <laughs> <laughs> please tell me you guys saw the javelin throw from the pakistani guy oh no, yeah that the... was i saw the replay of that on on, on social I mean, they were telling me that I guess there was somebody that posted about it that was like, hey, he didn't have any training sessions. He didn't. I mean, he didn't have a facility for this. He doesn't have the right equipment for this. He just came out and just basically threw this shit, dude. So, so for the listeners, th there was this guy from Pakistan who walked up to throw a javelin today. His name is Urshad Nadim. I swear to God, it looked like he was wearing dress pants and just got done eating Nihari. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it it we almost looked segmenting like he was... our audience. Clearly segmenting our audience, but go ahead. Okay, but it looked like he was forced to wear uh, sneakers. Like they forced him out of his bata chapels, right? Like and the guy <laughs> casually walked up and threw eighty nine point three meters. Like it's an Olympic record, almost the length of a football field. And imagine My if God. he got to keep his bata chapels on. <laughs> World record for sure. World record. Call it it. Uh, I'm so proud. Proud of our heritage right there. <laughs> so yeah, many, it's pretty so phenomenal. Many, so many awesome stories coming out of this year's Olympics. I don't think I've ever seen so many like. And, and maybe it's because of the social, right? Maybe you have the social media, the storytelling, and, and the, the broadcast the way that they've built it this year. I think it's really captured a lot of that um, this year. Even from a marketing standpoint, I think this is like. They said that this is probably the most driven uh, ad money revenue that they've ever seen in any Olympics ever um, by by billions um, on the spend that was done at the Paris Olympics. But also they're they're seeing the return on it, so that's amazing. Yeah, I didn't watch Tokyo, but it, it you can tell that like IRL uh, audience makes a huge difference to what people watch. Um, you know on TV and stuff as well. But all right, guys, let's get get started. Welcome to the number one podcast featuring three guys talking about marketing and random shit. Uh, my name is Adil and I am your host this week. Men go mad. Who's gone mad? Mad men. You're mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. mad. <laughs> Um, I am the self-proclaimed consumer man, and of course, in my week, I wanted us to be talking about new trends and where to spend your money. So each of us have a couple things that we've prepared to talk about. Um, Salim, you have a drink that's like sweating around you. I can tell it's leaving a ring on your desk. Why don't you go first? <laughs> man, you can call me out like that. All right, cool. Let's go. So a little energy drink quiz for you guys. Are you energy drink fanatics here at all? Not too much. Celsius every now and then. All right, we'll start with Celsius. What is the cost of a Celsius? Three ninety nine. Yeah, I'd say that. About two fifty nine. Okay. How about how about uh, sorry two twenty nine? My bad. Two twenty nine. How about Monster Energy, the number two top energy drink? By the way, Celsius is number three top selling energy drink. Number two, Monster Energy. How much for the big can? One ninety nine. Yeah, one ninety nine. All right, two thirty nine. And then the number one king of energy drinks, Red Bull, and the, and, and I would say the, the original. Uh, yeah, four small bucks. Can, huh? Ooh, two ninety nine. Two fifty nine. Close enough. It's basically, all under three oh, bucks. Wow. All under three bucks. All right, and the newest player in the energy drink, energy drink corridor is Starbucks. What do you think this glass of Starbucks cost? And note that the ice has melted, but the majority of this was ice. That's a lot of it's a lot of liquid. I don't want to go five bucks. Four fifty. Six dollars. Double the price of Ooh. any other energy drink on the market. 
the ob obesity, oh man, what the heck am I saying? The audacity of Starbucks to come out with a drink that was double the price of any other drink to break the market. And the worst part of this conversation is, is I went to Starbucks to go get this drink right now. And it, by the way, for you guys that don't know, we recorded like a nine o'clock, it's like 8.39. And the guy literally poured a glass of ice, opened this can of energy drink, and poured it in there and added syrup. <laughs> I was like, this is like, look, don't, don't get me wrong. Like we are, you know, we've talked about energy drinks before and, and Yahoo Finance has talked about how this industry is going to be about $188 billion in the next five years. It grows at about at an 8% CAGR. And in the U.S. alone, teenagers, 30 to 50% of teenagers consume this on a regular basis. And the energy drink also owns 18% of the non-alcoholic beverage market. So I see why Starbucks want to get into this. And they just launched their energy drink called Starbucks Energy and they had a big launch party in Atlanta, artists, and all these things came came across. And they had a big shebang about their new launch of energy drink. And at six bucks, which is double price of any energy drink on the market, I don't know if this is the right place for them, as they've just seemed to be tanking lately, right? They they they're they're the lowest perform worst one of the worst performers on the S and P. They're down double digits. Um, they've missed revenue expectations the last three quarters, and. You know, if you look at just the coffee alone, it's it's their price has gone up twenty five percent on the coffee, and yes, look, McDonald's has gone up forty percent, but they're still cheaper than Starbucks, so it's not a premium product anymore. They're, they've got this now just come and go atmosphere, right? You order on the app or you drive through and you get in and you get out. They're not that third place that they used to talk about back in the days, if you remember from Hertz's day, uh, Hertz's days, but. What does it do for the brand, right? What does what does energy drink do for Starbucks's brand, and you know what does it do as as this market is coming in? Like, is it going to make? Is it going to help them shift the numbers? Is it going to add enough revenue to this? Does it meet their goals? Like, what do you guys just take on on Starbucks now entering the energy drink market? Yeah, I uh, I'm thinking about you know at least this was a few years ago. Um, energy in the C store category, if you look at all the beverage doors, energy was the fastest growing segment out of all beverages. Two years ago, I'm citing right now, right? So forgive me for not having the latest. If that's still the case, and even if that's not seeing the amount of growth, energy as a segment is massive. Salim, I'm kind of with you that it is a little bit tricky. I don't, I don't quite understand what exactly they're going for. My first guess is they are alienating a certain amount of energy-seeking drinkers that just don't like coffee. So they're trying to provide some sort of alternative solution that people want energy with a quick meal or a snack, because McDonald's is increasingly becoming more for just an on-the-go snack or treat. It's not always a destination for a full meal. Um, so now we're getting into that C-store kind of convenience play. So now they have an energy offering that is not for the coffee consumer. So maybe there's something there that they're seeing that like energy as a segment is getting big. Like we all have experienced and seen the growth of energy for the last like five years. You guys remember Bang Energy, yeah. like completely like throwing everything against the wall there. Red Bull obviously continues the dominance there. You mentioned Celsius, massive, massive brand that grew so fast. I don't know. McDonald's seems to be trying to get onto something that's happening in Starbucks. the consumer world. I'm Starbucks, sorry, Starbucks, yeah. Starbucks, not McDonald's. Um, but it seems like Starbucks is like still trying to figure out what exactly is their non-coffee offering, and maybe this is their way their way in. We talk a lot about perceived value when it comes to when you charge something, when you charge more for something that um, you try to take the a pricing approach of like charging more for something that everyone else is like competing on a lower end. And you say, you know what, I'm going to charge more for it. Um, maybe there's some some psychological thing in that, that by paying more for something, you're going to get more energy. Right. Or you'll enjoy this drink more. Or the taste will be better. It's it's prepared. It's not like even though you saw it being poured out of a can, it's the fact that they added some flavor in, put some put it on ice. It it created this like just just higher value uh, associated with it. Right. So, I mean, if Celsius was to be poured that way, wouldn't you, you know, you just kind of expect it to have more energy and more just you probably will enjoy the drink more. So maybe there's that uh, psychological touch to it. But I mean, it seems kind of lackluster. I think their olive oil drink thing was such a flop. They, they're they like, we got to do something for our shareholders. And, uh, you know, let's do energy drinks. And that's probably what they're trying to do. I mean, I, that's all I could think. 
where do you think they are on that whole like double shot lineup there where they brought like kind of more energy coffee they kind of played right in the middle of that coffee drink energy drink space with that double shot triple shot espresso i don't know where is this supposed to go is this is this now the offering at the store same thing i don't know i'm trying to figure out i I agree with you right so if you go to their menu now right they've got the teas and they've got the coffee and then now they've got this energy drink and they've got this like boba drink now like it their menu is really just all over the place they're trying to find their their spot i guess and it's no longer just the coffee right and the the perceived value of the deal you talk about um it used to be the third you know you remember, i don't know if y'all remember like it used to be like the third place like between home and work it was like the place you gather and, and hung out um and now they, the stores have gotten smaller you see a lot like we go to the airport now and just like pick up and go and then you see all the other places now or just have pick up and go like only mobile order app is where in my office where my office is a starbucks there doesn't have any seating it's all mobile order only and that's really it um, and it's just that lackluster of experience for saying, hey, why do I pay this much for the coffee that I'm not just getting that experience? Like, their coffee is mediocre, <laughs> lots of flavors, they're very expensive. Um, but yeah, perceived value, I think, is, is, is going to lose it. It has lost its taste, and that's why the numbers show it. What did you yeah. say? It was, it was six bucks? Yeah, six bucks, like five eighty nine plus tax. So What's it called? You're... It's called Starbucks Energy. Oh, boring. <laughs> All right, so uh, Samir, we got to hear what you got next. Yeah, this one, uh, you know, very interesting. It, it's it just strikes a chord with me working in a corporate environment when we talk about presentations and slideshows. And when you think, when most people think of slideshow, it's always that dreaded work presentation or school project. But Gen Z, they're thinking party. Young people are throwing present presentation parties where guests are making wacky slideshows based off of different themes. PowerPoint parties now took off during the pandemic, right? We were all looking for ways to be entertained via Zoom, and it was one of the few things that we could do to bring us together. But instead of that fad fading away, it just migrated to an in-person activity for even bachelorette parties, birthdays, or now throw in presentation parties. Why? I'm, I'm sold that these young people have zero fear of public speaking or any sort of stage fright. They are constantly making content. They're so comfortable and and putting themselves in front of the camera. And now stepping in front of an audience to make a presentation is just second nature to them. The creativity here is insane. Some of the, the types of presentations that people are making at these parties, my adventures exploring the Cincinnati subway, an abandoned underground network of tunnels that was never fully constructed or a presentation on how great of a store is Bucky's and then Q slide. Can you imagine building these presentations in a way that's supposed to bring people together? I just think this is such a great kind of notion to think about PowerPoints coming back. I feel like there is so much energy around like having these unique types of gatherings. And honestly, for someone who might be afraid to be talking to someone or meeting people, this is kind of a great space for them to come and come prepared with a conversation, a topic that they want to talk about. And now you have an audience who's willing to hear and listen. Socially, I feel like this is such a phenomenal thing. Um, but from a brand perspective, I think PowerPoint can kind of make its way back with this. I think if if they or one of the other big slide dogs, right, your, your Google Slides or, or what have you, come in, keynote with Apple, Come in with with something that brings us together. I think we talked about AI and all these like PowerPoint generating machine learning types of presentation tools. You just enter a topic and boom, your whole slideshow is made. I don't think they're going to be the ones to come in here. This is like people want to create these things. People want to add their personal touch. They want to add personal photos, their own kind of structure to the presentation. Like this is a canvas for them to be creative on. Like this is not something that's just trying to get stuff done and get it out the email. Like this is something that people sit down, put effort in, and comes in front of their friends and family and make a presentation at a bachelor party about why you're taking this player for a number one fantasy football draft next year, right? Like that's the kind of things that are coming with this. And if PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides kind of comes at this with with something unique, I feel like it could be a really fun, really unique thing. What do you guys think? Yeah, have you seen those uh, uh, those like family get-togethers where they pitch like where they should do uh, their family trip. Yeah. I love those videos so much. Uh, and they all do it on PowerPoint and everything. This is a really good uh, way for 
maybe PowerPoint to play into it again, that this is like to get your idea across or to, you know, whatever, like where memory start or however they decide to take this. But more so than that, like there's something weird happening here. Like I, I was going back to the Olympics. Devin Booker was holding a camcorder courtside, right? Like everyone's wearing tube talk, uh, tube socks again. Like we are now like people are using disposable cameras again. PowerPoint is back. Like, I mean, here we are barely catching up to uh, to not wearing skinny jeans anymore. Now everyone's going back to what we did in high school, right? So, I mean, there's something that's like ev- everything is about going against the grain for Gen Z and what was cool for us or what was the norm before is now back and that's like the, the trendy thing to do. So just whatever's quirky, it seems to work and PowerPoint is quirky enough. Are you guys PowerPoint? I guess like there's PowerPoint, there's Canva slides now, and there's Google slides. Like, is there one that you lean towards? Like, are you guys all PowerPoint or is it like one of you like Canva or slides Canva. people? I despise PowerPoint. It is so bad oh. for for creative. It just doesn't work in advertising. Oh, I I would I would argue the other way. Oh, I, would, I would totally keynote is king when it comes to creative. Dude, I uh, I use I, Canva. So I, I, I'm a I'm a MacBook guy, so I, I've used Keynote again. Maybe I just don't do it right. I love PowerPoint. I am a I am I can, I'm a powerful self playing PowerPoint guru. I can make the craziest intense decks in the world, um, but like I can't like. Keynote is probably the one that I hear the least of, but from between Google Slides and, and just Canvas Slides, I can't stand those things. Just the usability of it, just the like ability to get creative, real creative on those slides, I can't. Like animations and, and how they present and how just the, how simplicity can be. Uh, there's just there's just some stuff missing there. But I guess kind of going to your point, like I think similar to what you're saying is like, hey, Microsoft has a play here with PowerPoint. I I actually think the other guys have a play. Your keynotes and your 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 Canva guys have a play here, right? Because what the problem here is, is that I don't think anybody argues about getting PowerPoint. Like PowerPoint doesn't get sold, right? PowerPoint is part of this O365 bundle. You get Outlook, you get Words, you get you get uh, Excel, you get PowerPoint. Like those things, one of those four products you need, they're all kind of bundled in. It's not an argument for them to go say, hey, look, let me go promote PowerPoint. But I think this is a good opportunity for for somebody to take this and say, hey, look, Canva, go build this like automatically. Or, hey, I want to do this and, and build it in Canva, right? I think there's there's some value for them to sneak into this market and, and overtake it and showcase that. But but yes, Adil, to your point, we did that for our group friends, like trips, like we'll bring in and like, okay, we're going to go here. Here's the hotel we're staying at. Here's a city park. Here's a map. Like go here, draw your pictures, book your flights on these dates. Like here's the budget. Like it's, it's all a PowerPoint. We come together for lunch or dinner or something and just... Uh, present it so definitely yes but now similar to the next party that I throw I'm doing a PowerPoint top party I'm gonna go get all the friends out and say here's the topics you go build your own slides and let's go have some fun and maybe uh, a, a few uh, uh, help help uh, help beverages on the side not from Starbucks <laughs> I, I want to keep debating this one because I think it's really fun I I think why I think Microsoft has a play here is because you called it PowerPoint presentations or PowerPoint parties. I think, can you think of any other tech platform? I'm gonna call Microsoft Office a tech platform that has lasted for decades and continues to be the vernacular about whatever we wanna call it, a Word, Excel, or a PowerPoint. It is constantly Microsoft Office, but in reality, you're probably using some other type of spreadsheet tool or other type of slideshow mechanic, but the, the word that comes out is always PowerPoint. I think I think Microsoft had at one point a very limited lifespan for when it could actually be sold to customers. It was in school and then at enterprise level. And then the, but you got all of these people who are avoiding the corporate world. You were all these people who have finished school, but you're trying to find ways to make them relevant. They have the kind of a personal edition trying to become a subscription where you can now be an Office 365 member and use it for personal reasons. I feel like this is there. I'm with you that it's less intuitive because Microsoft is known as the corporate guy, right? The 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 one that's not supposed to be able to do the fun stuff. But there is a tremendous brand equity there that we are all using sure. the word PowerPoint, even though we're probably using Google Slides in most cases. So that's that's the only reason why I'd let Microsoft sure. take the win. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, we can we can probably debate this for a long time, but you know, I mean, I think we're gonna lose a lot of listeners because it's. <laughs> 
<laughs> PowerPoint is is PowerPoint after all, and it's it's not that. I mean, uh, it's seriously going to go out of style if we keep talking about it. But um, I'll go next. So, so I want I want next time you guys are on Amazon, I want you guys to run an experiment. Um, open up any category on Amazon, whether it be electronics, toys, home garden, whatever, right? And scan the page, right? And see if you see brand names that don't really like you don't recognize like really weird names like you could say banky with two k's or three k's and clagged with two q's and all sorts of things <clears throat> now take a look at the product photos description note the price right then go and find that product on timu see if you can find it there using that brand name and whatnot then try to go on aliexpress try doing the same go look on TikTok. what you guys are going to start to see is that the world is actually a lot smaller now than it used to be so what i'm talking about is amazon is becoming timu and more and more amazon kind of built its popularity supporting small sellers right small mom and pop sellers and now this what Amazon has realized is that the real money is in brandless uh, shopping, right? And they started to test this with Amazon Basics and whatnot, but slowly China is completely taking over the U.S. consumer market. And I mean, we see it through Timu, through TikTok Shop, Shein, AliExpress. These are just becoming more and more widely used. But now even on our home platform, this was the one thing we had that kind of united America. This was the platform that bridged small sellers to like convenient shopping. Well, now these Chinese manufacturers have, have decided that they want to take it over too. So whoever gets the buy button is whoever sells it cheaper, cheapest, right? So that's what Amazon, uh, sorry, that's what these Chinese uh, manufacturers have done. So what I'm, kind of calling it now is I, I feel like we're seeing the death of the American retailer. And this, this is like maybe a trend that we could talk about as a trend, but I kind of want to make sure I put this down in history that the American retailer is slowly, slowly going to be replaced by the direct to ship manufacturer. It's going, it's going to be manufacturer going D to C. And we see that in front of our eyes, just in the fashion world with Shein. I mean, everything is brandless now. Shein is not a brand, in my opinion. They just sell cheap clothes, right? And it's for the for the newest Instagram post that you want to make. You make sure you have a new outfit for it, and it's not going to break the bank. So I, I, I feel like we're going to start to see this over and over in every category that we see. Um, and really the nostalgia brands is probably a big reason why some of these are coming back is because there's everything else is going brandless. And so now the nostalgia brands are starting to emerge again. What are your thoughts on this guys? You know, you bring up a really interesting point that, you know, with these kind of brandless items that are taking over our retail storefronts that we love and dear in America so much, it, it honestly, I feel like you start to bring up the question, do brands matter? Like, I think there's this model when you think like, you know, like in the wholesale side of things, like I feel like a purpose of that, of that business model is to curate and establish brands that retailers want to carry and then become a authorized reseller or have a partnership in place to be able to resell those brands. That doesn't matter for 90% of categories out there, I feel, which is to your point, I think 90% of Amazon, what the brand is doesn't matter. And I think you're totally right that like, that's where... Amazon has started losing share to Timu. I think that's where they're starting to probably realize they need to start playing from their playbook a bit and award some of these brandless names who are just competing for the buy box and then expect to see Amazon to be able to grow from that and copy a little bit of that model there. I think it's a really interesting point that you brought up around like these kind of brandless elements and everyone just fighting for price being the only thing. And as consumers, that's the only thing that matters at that and 90% and of categories out there. But, but, well, but go ahead, Celine. So, yeah. So what's the fix to that? Like, I, I, I'm trying to figure out the fix, right? I'm like, Hey, what is the fix to this problem? And, and, and the reality is, is you look at those brands, like look at the, look at, look at the bananas of the world, banana republics of the world, the Abercrombie, if you look at just fashion, right? If you're comparing it to Shein, 
and these brands, their manu- the product comes from other parts of the co- other countries. Right? None of that gets built here. It's designed here. The companies are here, but the fabric or, or, or the manufacturers coming from China, even in hardware products. Like I don't like th- the problem in this globalization problem is is let's say we cut it off, right? What, what you know and add tariffs to China so it increases their prices to come here and, and build this up, right? At the end of the day, the consumer is going to lose because the consumer in the U.S. can't build at that price. It just we've tried it. It's just too hard. Right, certain things cannot be built in the U.S. at that price. That's why either manufacturing caps in Mexico or China or something else. Right? I think there's a, there there's a industrial problem here, and we just need to find alternative businesses for that. Right? I think that's the that's the that's the only thing I can think of. Right? Like, hey, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna compete, like, look, I don't buy clothes from Amazon, but my wife does. Right? Or she and like, I don't buy clothes from them because I'm I have this quality requirement in my head. Like, I want to wear certain kinds of types of clothes that I want to feel and touch and, and know that I like the quality and I, I buy them for having them so I can wear them for months and years after. Right? I don't look at shirts and throw them away. Like, it's not a thing. Um, but that's just me. There's a lot of people that do it the other way around. Right? So I think what I would ask you guys is, is what's the fix to this? Because I don't see there's a fix, and I don't even think there needs to be a fix. Well. It, I- as long as there's going to be an obsession with variety, having a lot of options in your closet, there's really no fix, right? And so <clears throat> it's it's always going to come down to um, at what's the cost of that variety to my pocketbook and if I can get the maximum amount of variety. And, and I'm telling you from a very vulnerable place right now, we are facing this in the fashion industry right now. I mean, there's slowly no more need for a wholesaler. And then there's really eventually going to be no need for a retailer, right? Um, because people will find cheaper, better, faster ways to get you the product direct from the manufacturer. So Shein has manufacturing uh, cornered. They've they've now like, I mean, they will get an order, get it made, and ship to you within a week and a half. Like, I mean, that's insane. And you can get three shirts, four shirts for the price of one in the U.S. So why wouldn't you do that, right? Like, this is something that there is an obsession with variety. And they, as until that is out of our head, like, as, but that's you're fighting human nature. Human nature is to have abundance, right? So uh, until that mindset is out of our head, like, we may need, like, a Marie Kondo movement of like less is more and like people showing how less they, how much, uh, how few things they have in their closet to then say, Oh, this is what I want to achieve. Let me get, you know, it, so it's going to be a wave of things, but I, 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 I swear guys, like there's just like, this is really affecting a lot of American retailers. Um, uh, I see it I, firsthand. I, no, and I, I agree with you and I know you see it ground level, right. But I'd argue the other way around too. I see, you see companies like skims and, and stuff that are, are dominating and they're growing and they are going brick and mortar, right? They're vice versa, right? They're, they were direct to consumer first and now they're going retail shops, right? So there is some progress. You just have to, I think we've got, it's got to be a harder fix, right? And it's an idea of like Coca-Cola can, like I give you an example of Coca-Cola can, right? Gas station, Coca-Cola can, 99 cents. Go to, uh, 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 sorry, if you go to a grocery store, 99 cents. If you go to like the gas station, it's $3. If you go to a, a ball game, it's $8. Right, like you see the price variation. All it is is, is where are they where are you buying it from. I think that from that concept, you, you can look at it and say, hey, look, what what value are you bringing to the consumer at any given point, and figuring out, hey, can you charge for that, and is it is it cost effective? I think is is what the retailer has to get into now, right? I think it's figuring out, hey, what is the the the, the caveat to why they're existing? Like, why are they in existence? Is it just to sell clothes and, and the variety of clothes, or is it a specific style, a specific niche, specific quality, specific like what is your voice? So, so I, my answer to that is you're buying a 24 pack from the grocery store and you're buying one can from the convenience store, right? And so wherever it's more expensive, you may have those moments where you buy something more expensive, right? Um, but the reason why the most searched term in fashion is the word dupe is because people want variety of the thing that everyone desires. So you may have one pair of Lululemon leggings but you want multiple of the dupes. You may have one skims, you know, outfit or whatever, uh, shapewear, but you want the, 
you want multiples of the dupe. So, so th that's my argument to that is wherever the, vo the there will always be more volume wherever you can pitch price um, consciousness. And, and th this is just, I, I can't totally blame this on Instagram or anything. We just the globalization of online shopping has made it easier, okay. right? Like, I mean, for our kids, we can just simply say, oh, this is an interesting toy. Let's go ahead and order. It's only 10 bucks. And you do that 20 times, right? But how many times did we go to the toy store as a kid? Not that much, right? And if we did, maybe we spent 25 bucks, 30 bucks. But like th the volume and the ease of ordering now is so – it's it's just instant. And wh this is just across the board in every category. I'm I'm really seeing it firsthand in fashion. So I, we're, we're trying to pivot in different ways to, um, to absorb the blow because – we see it. A lot of small businesses are closing because they ask their cu customers, why aren't you coming back to shop with me? And they say, oh, I'm like shopping on Shein now. Um, so, I mean, enough about that. But, Salim, what's your next topic? <laughs> I didn't beat you too much. So, I got to put you on to something. You're, you're a consumer guy, so I'm going to make you buy something. You see one of these? This is the plot note. And this is an AI voice recorder. And when I say AI voice recorder, it is integrated with ChatGPT. It goes, it's got a magnet, it's uh, with MagSafe. You put it on the back of your phone, hit the record button in a meeting or anything else, and basically it records your meeting. And then it will bring you bullet points. It'll, it'll recognize different voices and say, person A said this, person B did this. It's got different variations of how the summary comes up. And, and for those that are watching the video on YouTube or, or on social, we'll, we'll put up the, the graphic. But this is a game changer for my meetings, right? I go into meetings and I just ask, of course, hey, can I record you guys? And we record this. And at the end of it, it just basically gives you a meeting summary and action items right off the back. And we can, and then you can summarize it, put it into a, in a, in a, in a notepad and start asking questions about it and say, hey, look, what did we say about this? Or what was that topic about? But, uh, and it's only 150 bucks. 150 bucks comes with ChatGPT 4.0. Um, and, it's 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 phenomenal, guys. So, uh, plod note AI, plod dot AI. The interesting part about this, I'm a, I'm a guy of business, a guy of me. You know, you you know, I like to go run and look at the deep of the business. But the only problem I see in this problem, this this company is, is I actually don't see the company. Like, if you go dig through the website, you go dig through investor stuff. Like, I don't see who's invested in this. I don't see where the company. Is. All I know is they are U.S. based. Um, but that's all I see. They won Design Award uh, in 2024. Um, here's the box. Um, it is Bluetooth functioned. I mean, it's a great product, but yeah. So, so it'll talk to your chat GPT app, like as a Bluetooth device. No, it's integrated. It's got its own plot app and it integrates chat GPT into it. So it's got oh, okay, chat GPT okay, okay. on its own app. Um, so you get it as part of the own apps. So then you can start asking me questions and say, Hey, look, my action item was to look up this information. Can you look it up for me? And it'll help you look it up. All right, so I'll go next. Um, I'm going to end the episode with a fun one. So uh, nose jobs and hair transplants are so in. Uh, this is coming from the bald guy with the big nose. <laughs> next, uh, so, I feel like next episode we're going to see a change. <laughs> Here's the thing. Social media platforms have uh, turned into a catalog for plastic surgery and uh, users are like practically saving their dream noses and, you know, and really shopping for surgeons in the process. Um, so some cool facts on this. Uh, cosmetic procedures grew in popularity by 102% in 2022 compared to the previous year. Rhinoplasties, these are the nose jobs, leading in popularity with 72% increase. Uh, and let's talk about hair transplants. So the global hair transplant market grew from $5 billion in 2022 to over $7 billion in 2023. There's literally influencers now for these, like, plastic surgeons in Turkey and they're, they're recruiting people and they're, you know, talking about their experience of getting this procedure done. And then think about in short form reels, you get this seamless transact uh, transition from the before and after of a nose job and the before and after of a hair transplant. Of course, it's going to grow in popularity, right? It makes it look so easy. makes it seem like that this is normal to do. 
Um, and that is true. Like more and more people are starting to become more open to plastic surgery. So please tell me I'm not the only one who's considered going under the knife. Salim, have you thought about getting anything done? Be real with us. So no, I can't say that I have. I, I don't think I, I've ever um, had a desire to go do things to under the knife. I, I know a bunch of friends that uh, have uh, considered doing the hair plant, similar to you. Well, less similar to you. They're not bald, but they basically have spots. So they're like, hey, we'll go and do that, right? Um, <laughs> so I think a bunch of people are going to be in Turkey uh, very, very soon. Um, so I think that'll happen, but, um, no, I, I can see it. I think it's, I think it's accessible. I think it's a part of it. And I think cost effective, like is, is good. And I think like, I've seen those TikToks and I've seen like one of them, like this one, one place, like basically talked about how, like even the Botox portion, right. They're like, like they got like 20 or 30 Botoxes. Like, I don't know how this works, but I'm not a Botox person, but I've seen a lot of people just, it just body stuff like, uh, tummy tucks and all that stuff. I think is, is just, you know easy, accessible, and reasonably priced, I guess, and, and whatever price is reasonable, I don't know. Um, but I see I see it. I agree with you. I think it's on the rise, and I think, yes, it, it'll become um, definitely better. Yeah, that's a wrap, man. <laughs> that I, We got to talk about some trending topics and uh, had some, uh, some fun in the process. I really feel like eating some Nihari now after talking about that Pakistani guy. All right, stay fabulous, guys. <laughs> Ciao. Men go mad. He's gone mad. Mad men. You're mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. mad. <laughs>